If Ukraine manages to pull off this one specific move, Putin isn't just in serious trouble, he is done for. Ukraine is trying to cross the Dnipro River, and here's why Russia will do anything and everything in its power to prevent that from happening. In June 2023, Ukraine launched its long-anticipated counter-offensive in two directions, south towards the Sea of Azov in Zaporizhia and in Donetsk in an additional two directions. One was a drive to the east around Bakhmut, the other was another southern drive around Valkaya Novosilka. One front that saw a lot of activity in 2022 has gone relatively silent, the Kherson sector. Kherson was the only regional capital that Russia captured in Ukraine when it started the war. The Ukrainians retook this city in November 2022, in the midst of their Kherson counteroffensive. Since then, the sector has stabilized in comparison with the others. There have been some probing and sabotage attacks and frequent exchanges of artillery fire, but these actions have been limited in scale. This should also come as no surprise, because Kherson sits right on the Dnieper River. Trying an amphibious operation across it in the face of fortified enemy positions risks terrible casualties, if surprise is not achieved, and everything else is not working in concert. However, if the Ukrainians manage to pull the move off, it could prove more devastating to the Russian war effort than anything else they've done so far. Let's take a look at how a Ukrainian crossing of the Dnieper endangers Russia, why Russia is keen to prevent this at almost any cost, and at the moves made in the area after 2022. Succeeding with a river crossing at Kherson would have one and only one aim in mind, cut off Crimea from the rest of the Russian forces in Ukraine. As of July 2023, Russia occupies about 17% of Ukrainian territory. The occupied area stretches in an unbroken land corridor from Crimea in the south to Luhansk in the north, up to the Russian border. Crimea is the hub from which much of the Russian forces stationed in Ukraine, especially in the southern part of the occupied territories, draw their supplies. Proximity to Crimea was one of the main reasons why the Russians' most successful campaign at the start of the war was in the south, while the Kyiv, Kharkiv and Donbass campaigns languished. Its military value to the Russians cannot be overstated. Crimea is also a highly political target. Vladimir Putin has staked a significant amount of his personal prestige at home over his illegal annexation of the peninsula in 2014. If Crimea were to be lost, it would be hard indeed for him to sell the war in Ukraine to the Russian public as a worthwhile cause that is going well, and Russian elites would grow even more uneasy with Putin's rule. As we have seen with the Wagner Rebellion at the end of June 2023, this elite dissatisfaction with Putin is growing. Losing Crimea would therefore be a catastrophic political turn of events for Putin's regime and the Russian war effort, and Kherson happens to be right by the peninsula. The Russians have heavily fortified their bank of the river, on the east side of Kherson, and shell the city and surrounding area on a daily basis. About 40,000 Russian troops are stationed in the sector. These soldiers have made no attempts to retake the territory they occupied and lost in 2022. Instead, their task is to pin the Ukrainian troops on the west bank of the river and prevent them from reinforcing other sectors of the front. To achieve a full breakthrough on the other side of the river would be a daunting challenge for the Ukrainians, even in the best-case scenario. Russian artillery, drones, and helicopters would make crossing operations costly. Ukrainian soldiers that made it to the other side would then have to deal with mines and trench networks which can be easily resupplied and reinforced. Like all amphibious operations, it would be difficult and could prove devastating for the attacking side if things don't go according to plan. However, if Ukrainian soldiers manage to force Russians to retreat from their positions on the eastern side of the Dnieper, across from Kherson, they would be less than 100 miles from Crimea. While an assault on the peninsula itself is unlikely for reasons we'll go into later, a straight push across the top of Crimea to the Sea of Azov would cut it off from all the Russian forces in Ukraine and subject it to siege-type conditions. War watchers have often discussed the prospect of Ukrainian forces cutting the occupied land corridor that stretches from the Russian border to Crimea. If they did so, it would isolate the Russian forces from the peninsula and cut them off from one of their most important supply lines. It would also cut Crimea off from being supplied via an overland route stretching back to the Russian interior. If this land bridge in Ukraine collapses, the only available ways for Russia to keep Crimea supplied would be via shipping or the Kerch Bridge which has already proven vulnerable to attack. Meanwhile, if Ukraine establishes a bridgehead across the Dnieper and can expand it far enough, all of Crimea would come into range of HIMARS. The Kerch Bridge would then promptly be destroyed and Russian supply lines from the peninsula threatened indefinitely, even should Ukraine be unable to succeed in completely cutting the Russians' land corridor to Crimea. 
supplying the troops would become much more difficult and dangerous for Russia, leading to a further degradation of effectiveness on the battlefield. Russian defenses in nearby Zaporizhia Oblast, for example, would become much easier for the Ukrainians to break through because of the lack of supplies coming from Crimea. A sustained crossing of the Dnieper River at Kherson, followed by a drive across the top of Crimea to the Sea of Azov, would be the shortest route to cutting it off from the rest of the Russian forces occupying Ukraine. While all eyes have been focused on Zaporizhia and the Tokmak Axis as the likeliest route to isolating Crimea, an attack from Kherson would be the shortest path to do so. It is the highest risk and highest reward counteroffensive option for the Ukrainians, and it is for this reason that Russia may be resorting to humanitarian disasters in order to prevent even the possibility that such an effort would succeed. Although it was unlikely compared to the Zaporizhia route, an attack across the Dnieper from Kherson would be so damaging to the Russians that most international observers and war watchers believe that the Russian forces in control of the Novokokovka Dam destroyed it on June 6. This act would help to prevent a counteroffensive in the Kherson region. Although the destruction of the dam made Crimea's water supply more precarious, the dam's reservoir was a source of water for the peninsula, it also left large areas across the Dnieper flooded, making the movement of artillery and armored vehicles all but impossible, and further constraining the options Ukraine has in the area. This would be reason indeed for the Russians to destroy the dam, especially when they already controlled it anyway. Putin himself tacitly acknowledged this motive when he said, this may sound weird, but nonetheless, unfortunately, this disrupted their counteroffensive in that area. Ukraine had in fact been conducting probing operations in the Kherson sector, doing reconnaissance work on islands in the river, despite the constant threat of Russian artillery and sniper fire. As early as April, Ukraine was reportedly scaling up its cross-river operations. Despite all the obstacles, Ukraine's special operators and territorial defense units were making small but steady progress in their objectives across the river sabotaging Russian equipment, spotting Russian assets to target in artillery strikes, and creating small footholds on the Dnieper's eastern bank. Ukraine was still far from being able to launch a full-blown counteroffensive across from Kherson, but the move scared the Russians. They forcibly evacuated residents in the nearby villages on the east bank of the river and then mandated them to apply for Russian passports. It was a sign that the Russians were taking the threat of a cross-river offensive seriously, and it helps to explain the motivation for their accused destruction of the Kokovka Dam. When the dam blew, it flooded many of the positions that Ukrainian soldiers had taken in these April and May operations, forcing the now isolated units to fall back and evacuate civilians while under deadly Russian fire. But the flooding may not be the only humanitarian disaster that Russia is prepared to create in order to protect the approach to Crimea from the Dnieper River. The destruction of the Novokokovka Dam also threatens the water supply for the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the largest nuclear reactor in Europe. This plant got caught in the crossfire early in the war, when the Russians captured it on March 4, 2022. During the battle there, a fire broke out at a training facility outside the main complex. This fire did not threaten any of the six reactors on the site, but a more serious close call occurred when a large caliber bullet pierced a wall on Reactor 4 and an artillery shell hit a transformer at Reactor 6, as reported by the New York Times. Fortunately, the battle around the power plant did not turn into a nuclear disaster, a second Chernobyl, but Russian forces occupying the facility have caused alarms in the international community ever since. In September 2022, operations at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant were halted as a precautionary measure. All but one of the reactors at the plant was put into cold shutdown. The fifth reactor remains in hot shutdown to process the steam for use in the treatment of liquid radioactive waste, which is collected from the six reactors even during a shutdown state. In a June 7th report, the IAEA stated that the destruction of the Kokovka Dam did not immediately threaten the sector, though it warned that if the reservoir's level falls below 12.7 meters, it would become impossible to pump water to the site. Workers at the power plant have since mitigated the risks, and on a June 15th visit, the IAEA's chief, Rafael Grossi, declared that the power plant could operate safely for some time. But that does not mean it is completely out of the woods from accidental or deliberate catastrophe. Ukraine's military intelligence chief, Kirill Budanov, said that the plant was in danger, warning that the Russians had mined the plant's cooler. On June 23rd, the Wagner Group revolted and soaked up international headlines, but on the same day, Budanov made a new statement that could have easily been of greater concern. He declared that Russia had plans in place to sabotage the Zaporizhia nuclear plant that it could put into action on a moment's notice. On implementation of the plan, the reactors would then melt down in anywhere from 10 hours to 2 weeks. 
Grossi denied some of Budanov's reports, saying that he and his team had discovered no new mines on their recent visit to the plant. For his part, President Zelensky said on June 20th that the Russians were considering another terrorist attack at the plant by deliberately leaking radiation. But why would the Russians go to such steps as to destroy the Novokokovka Dam and threaten the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, even if we take Budanov's statements with a grain of salt as we probably should? After all, these actions would be destructive to their own forces. A June 22nd assessment by the Institute for the Study of War indicated that the Russians could sabotage the plant to create a radiological disaster zone, echoing Zelensky. Although this move would make many areas in occupied southern Ukraine uninhabitable and ungovernable, further degrading Russia's ability to cement its occupation of southern Ukraine, and the destruction of the power plant would be a drastic act, Russian forces may be signaling that they are preparing to sabotage the ZNPP in order to dissuade Ukrainian forces from conducting counteroffensive operations in the area. The Institute for the Study of War cited Russia's routine threats of nuclear escalation as part of the overall assessment of the lengths the Kremlin might be willing to go to to ensure victory in Ukraine, or at least ensure that it does not lose Crimea. The ISW noted that the destruction of the Novokokovka Dam also harmed Russian forces, and possible Russian plans to sabotage the ZNPP cannot be ruled out and should be prepared for by Ukraine and its partners. On June 30th, Russian forces were reportedly gradually evacuating from the plant. This would not be done to create a demilitarized zone around the facility as the international community has routinely called for. Instead, it would be done in preparation for a radiological incident. Like the destruction of the nearby dam, it would be a way to constrain Ukrainian counteroffensives in the region. That Russia would go to such lengths to prevent a Ukrainian counteroffensive from crossing the Dnieper shows how important it is for them to hold this area and prevent Crimea from falling. The peninsula is the linchpin of Russia's strategy in Ukraine. If it were to fall, the Russian war effort in Ukraine might collapse, while the Putin regime would become potentially irreparably damaged on the home front. A sizable Ukrainian bridgehead across the river would at the very least force the Russians to divert large troop detachments from other parts of the front to prevent the Ukrainians across the river from expanding their foothold. This would in turn leave the Russian positions in Zaporizhia and Donetsk more vulnerable to the moves Ukraine is already making in those areas. Given how many casualties Russia took to just capture the city of Bakhmut, a breakthrough across the Dnieper would cause chaos as the Russians scramble to shore up their most vulnerable sector. It is understandable why Putin would want to prevent this from happening by any means necessary. For these reasons, Ukrainian President Zelensky has been keen to make the liberation of Crimea his ultimate war aim. The problem with his ambition is that taking the peninsula would be costly and require weapons that the West has been hesitant to provide Ukraine for fear of escalating the conflict. According to American defense officials, Russia has 70,000 troops assigned to the defense of Crimea. These troops are all well dug in and natural barriers would make them even more difficult to dislodge. There is only one way to approach the peninsula by land, and it is unlikely that Ukraine would be able to mount an amphibious operation across the sea in the face of Russian missiles and the Black Sea Fleet. But for Putin, a siege of Crimea would be almost as damaging as its liberation. Stories from the siege would be a constant flow of bad news for him at home, and he would not be able to suppress them completely. It would be just about the worst possible news for him while heading into Russia's presidential election of 2024. Elections in Russia are not free or fair, but with Crimea threatened, losses mounting in Ukraine, and growing public unrest at home, Elites in Moscow may decide they need to use the opportunity to force a change in their country's leadership and send an aging Putin into his retirement dacha. But would such a breakthrough across the Dnieper be possible now that the Novokokovka Dam has been destroyed? If Russia did destroy it deliberately, has its gambit paid off? In late June, weeks after the destruction of the dam, reports of Ukrainian special operators conducting new probing operations on the left bank of the river swirled around Russian social media channels. As recently as June 26th, locals said that Ukrainian forces had crossed the river and established a foothold on the eastern side, near the Antonivka Road Bridge, which had been destroyed in the successive battles for Kherson in 2022. According to Russian military bloggers and telegram channels, a Ukrainian force of about 70 men crossed the river and forced Russian forces on the other side to fall back to protect the integrity of their line and avoid encirclement. The Ukrainian unit reportedly seized the village of Dashi near the bridge. The Russian telegram channels and military bloggers sounded the alarm that the Ukrainians were not just there to conduct a raid, but rather were digging in and attempting to establish a bridgehead on the east bank of the river.
Ukrainian soldiers also reportedly seized complete control of summer villas near Oleshki, an East Bank town that had seen some flooding as reported by The Guardian. The Russian bloggers were highly critical of the military leadership for failing to respond adequately, saying that the command ordered a blind charge to storm the area, a tactic which had caused high casualties. These bloggers instead pleaded with the Russian military command to strike the bridge with missiles. On June 30th, an Iskander ballistic missile hit the bridge, but the damage could not yet be assessed, according to the Institute for the Study of War. Given the reported shortage of these missiles, which explains the lessening of attacks on Ukrainian civilian infrastructure over the course of 2023, it is telling that the Russians considered this light incursion important enough to use such a missile on. The ISW also reported on claims from military bloggers that the Russians used TOS-1A thermobaric artillery systems near where the Iskander struck. The military bloggers have also complained about the troops there lacking the ammunition they need to fight. Prior to these operations, reports swirled that Ukraine's allies have been supplying boats for potential river-crossing operations. These boats would not be able to ferry a full-blown amphibious invasion force, but can help probing operations like that seen by the bridge at the end of June. Whether the boats were used or whether more such tactics will come remains to be seen. It is more likely than not that the operation on the left bank of the Dnieper, reported at the end of June and start of July, is part of a diversion or an attempt to keep as many Russian forces in the Kherson sector pinned in that area as possible, rather than a full-blown attack. This would be done to prevent them from reinforcing the Zaporizhia front where Ukraine is taking counter-offensive action. But what would an actual offensive across the river look like? Could Ukraine be trying to do the unthinkable as it gains less ground in Zaporizhia and Donetsk than its leaders and international observers had been hoping for? Ironically, the flooding caused by the destruction of the Novokokovka Dam may have made a river crossing operation easier for Ukraine to pull off. About a month after the initial explosion and flood, water levels in parts of the area have receded and left behind a sandy plain on some parts of the river. It remains to be seen if this new plain can support the movement of artillery, tanks and other vehicles and equipment the Ukrainians would need, but the possibility is open that the destruction of the dam could have backfired. An assault across the Dnieper straight toward Crimea and the Sea of Azov is still the least likely option among Ukraine's potential strategies. However, Putin and his regime would lose so much if the Ukrainians successfully carried out an amphibious operation that they will resort to almost any escalation to ensure that it does not happen. Whether the cross-river operations at the end of June near the bridge develop into anything grander remains to be seen. But what do you think? How likely is an amphibious Ukrainian counteroffensive in the Kherson sector, in the face of the now partially flooded area? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe.